Let's pray together. Blessed are you, O God, our creator, ruler of time and space, who has kept us alive and sustained us and brought us here to this moment. Amen. There's a story told about me and my family. It's one of those stories that sort of foreshadows uh, the path of life that I've taken, the, you know, the kid who grew up to be a minister. It's a story that I don't remember because evidently this, is, this happened when I was three or four years old, growing up uh, on a farm in North Carolina. Uh, one of the things that my dad did a lot of, because we had wood stoves, was he'd be out chopping down trees, cutting them up into kindling and, and logs, and he was doing that one day. He had his pickup truck pulled down into the bottom of our property, and me, little kid, thought everything that my dad did was fascinating, and so I was dad's shadow. My dad's a very religious person. We don't always, we often don't see eye to eye theologically, but he is a person of devout faith. And it just so happened on this day, as he finished the work that he was doing, as he loaded all of this lumber into the back of his pickup truck, he started praying. It's kind of the way my dad is. And he was praying out loud. And so to my little eyes, it just looked like my dad was talking to somebody who wasn't there. Who in the world are you talking to? I said. Well, my dad said, I'm talking to Jesus. And at that, I just look even more puzzled. Well, where is Jesus? I've been wanting to talk to him too. <laughs> to that, my dad said, well, Jesus is all around us. Jesus is right here with us in the field. Jesus is everywhere that we go. Jesus is even up at the house with your mom. And with that, my dad went back to his work. And in a couple of moments, he turned around and I'm not there. You know, I'm that age where we'll kind of scamper off and turn your back and they're gone one minute. They're, they're here one minute, they're gone the next. A couple of minutes later, my dad heads back up to the house and my mom meets him and says, what on earth did you tell her? <laughs> she came up here saying, I want to see Jesus. Dad said that he was here at the house. <laughs> so I showed up at my house demanding to see Jesus. That's kind of how faith works sometimes, I guess. You know, I didn't quite get it, I guess, at three or four years old, but faith is about looking for stuff that we can't see, right? It, it's about believing in the reality somehow of that which we can't put our hands on or lay our eyes on. Our sacred stories remind us of this again and again and again. God doesn't see what people see, we're told in the first book of Samuel, in the story about how David, who by all accounts was the runt of his family, came to be anointed as the future king of his people. People look at outward appearances, but God looks at the heart, is what we're told there in 1 Samuel. Faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews tells us in the opening lines of what has been called the faith chapter of the Bible, or the hall of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, faith. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the eternal God through the voice of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Didn't I tell you, asked Jesus in John's gospel, that if you believe, if you have faith, you will see the wonders of God. And with that, the story goes, Jesus called out to his friend Lazarus, who was dead, or so they thought, and in a moment, he stepped out of the tomb, raised to new life. Faith has this way, perhaps beyond our understanding of building a bridge between what we can see and what we can't see. And it even has a way of connecting who we are on the inside to who we are on the outside. Our outer nature is wasting away, St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the passage that Sean read to us just a few moments ago. Thanks, Sean. On the outside, Paul wrote, we are fading, we're wasting away, but 
But on the inside, on the inside, we're being renewed day by day. We are told and we believe that somehow there's this sort of space between our outward nature and our inward nature, that the outside isn't necessarily congruent with the inside. That the inside may not exactly match the outside. That is faith. Now, when it comes to how we are made, how we are both inward and outward beings, how we are both bodies and souls somehow bound together, I don't quite know what to say. Aristotle said that the soul occupies the body like a prisoner occupies a prison. Plato said that the soul is kind of like a pilot or a captain of a ship and the body is the ship itself. St. Thomas Aquinas said that even though the body is an essential part of our being, our souls are somehow independent, not bound to our flesh. Not everybody thinks this way, of course. The awakened and knowing, wrote Nietzsche, say this, body I am entirely and nothing else. The soul is only a word for something about the body. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin might say to Nietzsche, well, you're on the right track, but you've, you've got it backwards. That theologically and scientifically brilliant Teilhard rather famously said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And of course, according to the folks over at Disney Pixar, what's inside us is this complex cast of characters, anger and joy and disgust and and soon to be anxiety, uh, according to the previews. And the ways they relate to one another can, can change the way that we express ourselves outwardly. Well, I am no Aristotle, I'm no Nietzsche or Teilhard, I'm I'm not Pixar and I'm not St. Paul, thank goodness. I don't know what it means to confess that we are body and soul. I don't know how to make sense of the spiritual and material cocktail that we call a human being. But I know that faith points us towards realities that we can't understand or make sense of or even see sometimes. I have faith that objectivity is not the sole criteria for the real. And I find comfort in the language of scripture and that voice that describes us as body and soul. Don't be afraid, Jesus says, of those who can harm the body but not the soul. This he's telling to his disciples as he sends them out into the world. He says, what you should really be afraid of is the one who can harm both the body and the soul. These two things that can be harmed or not harmed independently of one another, Jesus seems to be saying. In this passage about coming out into the open, he talks about how God cares for us all and and that our bodies and souls are precious, but that they can be fragile and susceptible to harm. And in the words of Jesus, they're somehow, in some way, different from one another, body and soul. There's this distance between them. Now, many of us take this in faith. We can't see our souls. We can't locate our souls. But we sense it, don't we? It's a reality that somehow we experience, right? Now, as a transgender person, my experience of body and soul has been fraught at times. I think many of us can relate to this idea, this notion that there can be a tense relationship between our bodies and our souls, a disconnect between who we are on the outside and who we are on the inside. I think we all kind of know what that's like, but our trans siblings especially, I believe, have a unique understanding of all this. A few months ago, just as the AI tool, ChatGPT, was becoming more and more popular, I still don't quite understand what it is or how it works, but people use it to do school assignments and write things, and one of these days there's gotta be a uh, ChatGPT-generated sermon. Who knows if it'll be good or not? (laughs) It's only as good as what you feed into it, I understand, so I guess it depends on who is generating it. But a few months ago, just as it was starting to gain in popularity, someone prompted the bot to write a fake Bible passage about Jesus accepting trans people. And it got shared all over the internet. Now, one of the key words here is fake, 
right? The resulting text is not sacred scripture, but it is created using the text and the tone of the Bible. Like I said, what comes out is what goes in. And if what goes in is the scripture, it's going to sound an awful lot like the scripture. And, and so it certainly has that feel. And it says this. And a woman whose heart was divided between spirit and body came before him. In quiet despair, she asked, Lord, I come to you estranged, for my spirit and body are not one. How shall I hope to enter the kingdom of God? Jesus looked upon her with kindness, replying, My child, blessed are those who strive for unity within themselves, for they shall know the deepest truths of my Father's creation. Be not afraid, for in the kingdom of God there is no man nor woman, as all are one in spirit. The gates of my Father's kingdom will open for those who love and are loved, for God looks not upon the body, but the heart. I think that's beautiful, actually. <laughs> so the person who created that, who prompted ChatGBT to write that, is a trans person who wrote that they were feeling particularly sad on that day and wanted something to cheer them up. And I'm pretty sure it worked. I love the way that this trans person is described in this AI-generated text as someone who feels estranged someone who comes before Jesus admitting that her spirit and her body are not one, someone who is striving for unity within herself. That is not scripture, but it's true. It's true. Just about any trans person can vouch for it. We are ones that often without understanding what's going on, strive for unity between body and spirit. We are ones who feel estranged. What we seek to use more language from scripture, is reconciliation. Reconciliation is such an important word in the Christian tradition. St. Paul is content summing up the whole of the gospel with that one word, reconciliation. He says, be reconciled. He pleads, be reconciled with the Romans and with the Corinthians. Reconciliation, in, in Paul's way of speaking, is salvation itself. And here, in our church and other churches, we have often confessed that we believe in the reconciliation of all things. It's one of my favorite parts of the creeds. We believe in the reconciliation of all things. For trans people, transition is an act of faith. It's an act of reconciliation. It's a leap into that mystical chasm that separates soul and body. Now, it's a leap that comes with risk. It's a leap that comes with vulnerability. It's a leap that can put us with, at odds with the world around us. But that's often how faith works. Back in that faith chapter in the book of Hebrews, we're told that for faith, some were tortured, some faced jeers and beatings, some were chained and put in prison, some were stoned to death or sawed in two or put to death by the sword. For faith, the writer of Hebrews tells us, our ancestors were destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Faith is a powerful thing, but it can be risky. Faith is, is a candle. It's a flame that others see and sometimes want to extinguish. But faith is something we keep against the odds. And it's something that compels us to be compassionate with one another and to bear one another's burdens. As you've heard already in the service, tomorrow is Trans Day of Remembrance. It's a day that started back in the late 90s to remember um, one or two trans women that had been murdered the year before. And it's continued every year since. Starting in 2008, uh, a list of trans people lost to transphobic violence started to be compiled. In many years, that list is longer than the year before. It's cold comfort, but I'm somewhat happy to say that the list is a little shorter this year than it was last year. That's the first time that's happened in, in a good while. It's not necessarily good news, but it's promising. We come to this day in the life of our church, and we always wonder, well, what do we do? How do we mark this? This year's list has 320 names on it. There's probably more. 
because those 320 names just happened to be the people that were reported in the media, the people that were reported correctly. A couple of years ago, we read all the names together, not one at a time, but maybe some of you remember, there were three or four of us up here who read all the names at the same time, and it was just this cacophony. So I'm never quite sure what to do on this day or how to do it. Well, today, rather than reading all the names, I want each of you to have a page from the report. Um, the Trans Respect Project compiles a report each year, and each page is a name, a life lost, and some details about how their lives were lost. And I think our ushers are gonna pass that out right now. Uh, if you're tuning in on YouTube, I think our digital usher will drop a link into the chat. I have a page from the list too. And just take a few moments and, and take that page and have a look at what it says. Look at the name, look at the details. Like I said, there are 320 people in this year's report. I think that means that a couple of you could take two pages if you wanted. I have the first one. Um, the list is compiled between October and September each year. The first entry in this year's list was a woman named Tiffany Banks. She was a young woman under 25 years old, a, a stylist, a hairdresser in Miami, Florida. And she was shot and killed on the first day of October last year, the first day of the period covered by the Trans Day of Remembrance Project 2023. Four days later, a man was arrested and charged with second degree murder. Each of you have a name in front of you. Some of you may have a page that says unknown. Some of you have details that are disturbing in front of you. I hope that you'll take this. I don't know exactly what to tell you to do with these. I just wanted everybody to carry this together. You can take it home, put it on your coffee table, Pray for that person's memory and that person's family. You can fold it up and put it in your purse and never think about it again. You can leave it on the pew if you want to. I just wanted to do something that kind of spoke to the magnitude of what happens on Trans Day of Remembrance. And I want to wrap up with a prayer. And I, I'm going to prompt you at a certain point to say the name of the person on your page. We'll just all say it together as you're able. Oh God, inspire us to challenge and to stand strong against the forces that allow needless harm and violence to continue, against things like prejudice and unjust laws and repression and stigma and fear. O oh God, into your care, we trust and lift up the hundreds of souls who have been tortured and murdered. Tiffany. God, we lift up to you our dreams of a world where all are cared for, our dreams of wholeness, our dreams of reconciliation, our dreams of a world where all are accepted and respected. A dream, O oh God, of love, we know that you share. Amen. Amen.